So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, one of the real amazing perks of my job as Vice Chancellor is that I get the opportunity to speak with some incredible people who pass through Shanghai. And this afternoon is even within that set especially exciting for me as I get to speak with Michelle Kwan. I am very happy to say that Ms. Kwan has given me permission to call her Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> so from now on, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm first going to take a few minutes to introduce her, and then we're going to have a conversation uh, over here. And after that, we're going to have some open Q&A, so you might want to think about what kinds of questions you would like to ask her. So Michelle was born and grew up near Los Angeles. Her older brother and sister both enjoyed ice skating. So it was natural for Michelle to take up sport. When she was eight years old, she started serious training. When she was 11, she took ninth place in the US Junior Figure Skating Championships. And in 1994, when she was 14, she won the World Junior Championship. By then, she had already begun competing at the senior level, kicking off a decade of unmatched skating preeminence. In the 11-year stretch from 1994 through 2005, she won the United States Championship eight times and finished second place the other three times. In the nine-year stretch from, from 1995 through 2004, she won the World Championship five times, finished second three times, and third once. She received a silver medal in the 1998 Olympics and a bronze medal in the 2002 Olympics. Michelle's figure skating honors are far too many to list. I would note only that she was the first figure skater in more than 50 years to win the James Sullivan Award as America's Best Amateur Athlete and only the fifth figure skater to be named Sportswoman of the Year by the U.S. Olympic Committee. After she won the Reader's Choice Figure Skater of the Year Award seven times, the U.S. Figure Skating Association renamed it to the Michelle Kwan Trophy. <laughs> in 2006, Michelle suffered an injury in practice, uh, not nearly her first injury, I must say, but she suffered an injury in practice that forced her to withdraw from the American Olympic team that year. And at that point, she decided to pursue a higher education. She earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Denver, and then a master's degree from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Now, some of you may know that our own professor, Ivan Rasmussen, earned his PhD from the Fletcher School, and he and Michelle were classmates there, and that is why we have the good fortune having her with us today. So thank you, Professor Rasmussen. Now, as her choice of study at the Fletcher School indicates, Michelle uh, has a special interest in the world of public diplomacy. The US State Department named her a public diplomacy ambassador in 2006 and a senior advisor for public diplomacy and public affairs in 2012. She was an active and visible member of Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign in 2016. I ask you all to please uh, join me in giving a warm NYU Shanghai welcome to Michelle. So if it's OK 
get with you. Uh, I'd like to talk with you about a few of them uh, one at a time. They have to do with being excellent, uh, with innovating, uh, with keeping both the public self and the private self, uh, with moving from chapter to chapter over the course of a long life. So I want to begin with excellence. So uh, in the first chapter of your life, ooh, I need to make sure I've got the uh, clicker to be able to advance the slides here. I may have left it up there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So in the first chapter uh, of your life, um, you worked incredibly hard uh, to become the best in the world uh, at an activity that required you to combine athleticism and artistry. That was your goal. And you achieved it through this combination of focus, incredibly hard work, talent, and resilience in the face of setbacks. And what I'd like to ask you about is how you understood what it meant uh, to be excellent. So here's, here's the, the framing of the question. Was the excellence that you were striving for something that came from the outside, from the standards that the judges were using? Uh, so when you were competing, there was a number, 6.0. Uh, and that is what constituted perfection in the eyes uh, of a judge. And you were vastly more 6.0s than any other skater in history. Um, so the question I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get at is, was the excellence that you were seeking, was it a 6.0? Was it what the judges were thinking about? Or was it something that came from inside you? Was there, did you have your own vision of what it meant to skate a great program? Or was it some combination of the two? I think it was a combination of the two. Um, you know, starting skating at five years old, getting on the ice for the very first time, and I remember it so vividly because it was a, a lesson about falling. And I looked at my skating coach and I was like, I want to go skating. I look at these skaters. I want to go flying. I want to do jumps and I want to do spins and I want to look really cool. I don't want to learn how to fall. I'm not going to ever do that. Um, but it was something that I, I wanted to get better. I wanted to learn some moves, like stroke across the ice. I have older siblings, I have an older sister, Karen, and older brother, Ron. And, you know, having older siblings, I was always the, the little one tagging along, and I had to learn fast, too, because uh, when you have an older brother, like my brother, Ron, uh, Ron McDonald, Donald, uh, he, he takes you, and he holds your hand, and he's like, oh, I'm gonna let go, and he lets go when I'm going 500 miles per hour, and I'm like, oh, I don't know how to skate, but you learn quickly to like dodge skaters and you know and I started to get better and better. So I don't know if that was striving for excellence or trying to keep up. Um, but as I got better in skating it was you know learning jumps and uh, perfecting elements like flying camel and triple jumps and so you work with single jumps, single rotation, and then you work into doubles and then you work into triples and then you climb the ranks of uh, preliminary, juvenile, intermediate, junior, senior, and then make it to the world championships and the, ideal, the Olympics. So it was always like, there was always one step in front of another and always reaching and striving. And of course, you know, getting to the elite level where it was the 6.0, and that's when you, you look at the scores like perfect 10 or what you call like A plus when you look at an exam. So it was always that feeling of wanting to get personally better and also trying to perfect what I thought was attaining that perfect score. And, you know, even when I looked at my career, even when I was five-time world champion, it was like, there was always areas where there were tough spots. Like, I, I had tough areas of not doing a triple loop very well, which is very specific. But it was that, like, daunting jump that I was like, back outside the edge, it was like, <laughs> like, if I could actually verbalize it, that's what was going through my head. Um, but throughout my career, I was just trying to be better. And I am one of the athletes that I don't necessarily compete against somebody, necessarily. It was always trying to be the best version of myself. And that was what always made me 
hungry for the next event. It's like internal kind of competition. And yes, I was striving for perfection, 6.0, but at the same time, it was always like creating your own game in your head. So whatever that might be, and challenging yourself to be better. And I know that all of you probably do very well in certain areas, like what you're majoring, and then certain areas that you don't, you know, is there a weak spot? So knowing those weak spots is a plus, and then figuring out what works and like how to get better. And so I'm always, even now post-skating, it's like, I've always thought of that as like a, I'm a student for life and always trying, not to be perfect, but trying to grow and to learn. Terrific, terrific, thank you, thank you very much. So my next question is actually about innovations. Let's see if the slides click. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here we have some, some pictures. And uh, so this, this shows. That figure uh, is so, that's what Frank Carroll is very famous for. Like, so, <laughs> don't mess with that figure. So Frank Carroll is your coach. Yeah. Uh, and then the bottom, bottom center picture. So, so what I actually want to ask you about is actually this, this one on the right here. Um, and I'm going to show a clip in a second. So this one over here. So uh, I'm not an expert on figure skating, but I can tell everyone here that you are doing a spiral here. Yes. And so a spiral means you're standing on one skate and your other leg is uh, crazy high. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in this, in this, uh, what you're doing here is so so you're you're there there are two sides to this uh, blade here. So you're on the outside edge here, and and you're 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 spiraling in a clockwise direction. And you can also uh, be spiraling on the inside edge, going in a counterclockwise direction. And one of the things that that you did in your career that you are extremely famous for is the change of edge spiral where you seamlessly uh, floating through the air uh, start out on the inside edge uh, going uh, counterclockwise and then just somehow magically start on the outside edge uh, going clockwise. So I just want to show a little clip of you doing this and then I'm going to ask uh, a question about it. Oops. How do we make that play? I couldn't do the splits. Like, you know how you, when you see some gymnasts who do the splits? 
I didn't know how to do this with that photo. And so it was like limitations and things that I wasn't able to do. And I saw and I compared myself like, oh, well, I want to learn that. The grown-up skaters at the senior level, they have spiral sequence and their legs go way up higher and they do wheel ins and they do things that I can't do. So um, what I did for the next two, well, from that photo till 15, <coughs> when I won my first world championships, was literally, there's no, there was no um, cheat, there was no like shortcut. It was like stretching every day, watching television and like hours before, uh, in the morning and the evening, very, in a very um, methodical, I'm gonna get my flexibility and it hurts and I'm gonna do this. But it was very persistent. Um, and then work my way up to being able to do an inside and outside. But it didn't happen overnight because what traditionally in, in figure skating you have, you know, the inside spiral and then the outside spiral, but it's like a transition into it. And I'm like, I want to do, I want to have a statement piece in my, when I look back in my career, I want to be, you know, I want to have one that's like an iconic thing. And this is what I was thinking. Like this is, I remember exactly that moment where there was nobody on the ice and I was just like goofing off. And sometimes creative process is when you step away from all the curriculum and the structure and the framework and this and that, and you, you have this like creative moment. And wherever that moment takes you, know, sometimes it might be in the middle of the night, and you're like, oh my God, that dream was like, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to verbalize that dream or write it down or like, wherever it is. For me, it was like that time where I didn't, I wasn't working with the coach, I wasn't, and I was just skating and having fun, and I was like, I'm gonna look back and have a, a like, that is a Quan move, that is, you know, Nancy Kerrigan had a particular move, and I always thought, I pictured Nancy as like, one of the skaters, you know, that I looked up to, and and she had a move that was kind of a dancing move that was like something that I remember. And I said, I'm going to do something that nobody, no skater has done. And trust me, I like fell on my face, like, <laughs> and I'm serious, <laughs> <laughs> fell on my face. I mean, doing a spiral like that, where your face is not too far from the ice. Uh, but it, it was not pretty the first many, many, many times. And, you know, it was also convincing my coaches and my choreographer who put to go, together programs and music and that it was cool. And so it was, it was a, a, a trial and error. And um, I, I think that that was what you would say innovative and a creative thing and hasn't been done. And I, I wanted to challenge myself, and it was a leap of faith, and um, and also challenging and fun and all that stuff. So it was now I can look back and say I was innovative, but <laughs> I don't know. Can so I, I, I actually I, I love that that you actually even remember this moment when you were out on the ice messing around, thinking I want something, and then somehow this came to you that this was something that no one had done and that you yeah. could do. And it came from somewhere, and so so actually, the neural scientists right now are fascinated by this particular <laughs> moment when when creativity and innovation happens, and, and your story fits with what they're telling. Well, I witnessed it actually today, speaking to the students, dropping in some of the classrooms. I don't know if the student here today uh, that showed me his his project that he was working on. Ivan was it. Uh, the selfies are within a selfie, and it was a game, and it was like, huh? I mean, yeah, the, the lab, and I was like, this is discovery, this is something that he was describing as narcissistic, it was like a selfie, and then you walked into the brain, I'm sorry if I'm giving too much, <laughs> and I was like, he was like, it's my brain, and then within the brain, it was like selfies, and then selfies, and who knows, that that's, how architects and artists and, you know, I consider myself an athlete, but also somebody that had a canvas of the ice and freedom to design and um, create and have this magic moment. And what I would encourage all of you is taking this opportunity to explore. And there are 
you know, mistakes that you'll make, but and you'll fall flat in your face, hopefully not literally like me, but uh, that you learn and you have this uh, amazing institution, this NYU that allows you this freedom to grow and to learn and fall on your face and, and get better. And you'll always do that, I mean, here, but this is such an opportunity for you to do anything. But, you know, when you go and find a job, it, sometimes the creative time is, is limited, but you need to find a space. Maybe it's not in your job, but somewhere else to find that time where you can be creative and explore and grow. And, and at times, I, I was saying to you earlier that I've learned so much being here. And I think as you get older, I'm 38, it's like 38. But when I'm with people who were born in 99, you're like, oh my gosh. But you've really been inspiring today. It's like how you guys think, how you guys, it reminds me of when I was 19, and like how fresh your mind is, and how nimble and agile, and how you're willing to learn and put yourself out there. So it's like, continue to do that. And I, I learned from you guys, because I was that. And I, as you get older, you kind of become stuck in your rut and you're like, you start to analyze and you start to say, I can't do that because this and that and this. And you have lots of responsibilities and you always do, no matter what age. But I think that's what is a reminder for myself as I'm here at NYU that I, I'm like, it's a reminder that I, it's, you're always growing and you, you kind of have to put yourself in that place where you want to be a better version of what was yesterday. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. So now I want to switch uh, from the specifics of skating to a larger sort of uh, view of your life, and, and that is uh, this this business of keeping a public self and a private self. So you were driven by this quest for excellence. You wanted to excel. You wanted to win uh, in competition. You wanted to keep going up the ranks. And then, uh, when you succeeded, uh, something happened. Oops. Wrong case. There we go. So you became famous. Uh, you became a, a mega celebrity. You were on the cover of all these magazines, um, and you had a a public self that was visible to the entire world. Uh, and you were a teenager, and you had to suddenly deal with the fact that everybody wanted to know everything about you. Uh, they didn't want you to have a private self. Uh, they wanted to know everything. And if they didn't know it, then they would just imagine what it must be, and they would make it up. So they would try to imagine what you must feel inside towards Tara Lipinski and Sasha Cohen. Uh, they assumed that you must, must just uh, <laughs> I'll tell you later. Um, <laughs> but they, they assumed that you must hate your competition. And so so after at the Olympics in 98, Nagano Lipinski skated the very best program of her life, and she won the gold medal in the Olympics. They wanted to hear your rage. And, 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 and you had no choice, really, but to talk about what your emotions were. That was your private self. But you were sort of dragged out there, and you had to show that your inner self was actually different from what they assumed. You weren't enraged, you were disappointed, uh, but you didn't feel fury. And the reason I want to go to this point is that in today's social media world, more and more of us uh, find ourselves with something of a public self than was true uh, 25 years ago. So it was once an issue only for celebrities, is now an issue for almost everybody. So I was wondering if you could share a few thoughts about the challenge of maintaining a private self that the public doesn't get to see, and maybe some advice for how to define an Instagram self that doesn't end up hurting you later. Wow, that's very intense. I just feel like yeah, it's sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a therapy session right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, so yes, I mean, I, going 
going back to the age of 13, right after that you know, picture of me being a little girl scared to death, going, wow, I'm in front of a thousand people, this is really happening, um, to the incident in 94 with Tanya Harding, Nancy Kerrigan, and um, most of you weren't alive then, but I was 13 years old and I, I started to see my face on television. This was before Instagram's twi Twitter, 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 <laughs> all that stuff, Facebook. Um, and chased, chased by, uh, not paparazzi, but uh, they, there was satellite uh, trucks that were camped outside my training facility. At the time, I didn't have a manager who you know, could filter and you know, I, I didn't know what to do. My parents didn't know what to do. Um, they were you know, trying to shelter me or protect me from all that was happening because I don't know if you all know the incident. It was um, uh, when the skaters got attacked. I was actually right behind her when it happened. I, yeah, go back, going back to like the incident, um, which was very frightening, and I had lots of questions. So I was like, she was attacked. How did she get attacked? Like, and it was scary, and I and people were chasing me, trying to get interviews, and I had no idea what was happening. But I soon after found a manager who, uh, who represented Mary Lou Retton, a very, very famous uh, uh, gymnastic icon, uh, amazing athlete, amazing person. And his advice was like, you just have to be yourself in interviews. Um, and I always, he's no longer with me, but that is always something as a reminder or anything, whether it's public or private, is just, it's me. Um, there is no, there's this person and then I'm somehow different. Um, I am, as I was saying in that small round table, I am Gorba, we were saying the Briggs, the Briggs, uh, Briggs Myers, Myers Briggs. Um, kind of what, are you an extrovert, introvert? I'm like, I'm an extrovert sometimes when I have to be, like, I have to be like, <laughs> and it scares me that I hate public speaking, but that's another story. Um, and then I'm very much of an introvert where I like speaking, but it's exhausting. Um, but I, I had to recharge when I'm in my private space. Um, but going back to the, your question about the responsibility or the platform that everyone and each of you have is representing yourself in all these different platforms, and whether it's Instagram or Wibble or, or WeChat, or it somehow is going to affect you later on. So being conscious and aware of what you say, how you're, not representing yourself, but how you're putting yourself out there. And this is something that you have to be conscious of, and also it could be such a positive outlet where you could find communities out there that you really you know, you share common interests or you are fighting for a particular issue, whether it's women's equality agenda or whether something is in politics or econ or intelligence, everything, right? So it's a way to connect. Um, so I don't know, I, I see it as a positive and a negative and I think you have to make the most of it. And I've been reluctant, I was reluctant for a long time to get on Instagram. And it was actually more recent that I have a, a friend, I don't know if Jonathan Van Ness, you know, where I, okay, see, Gen X, millennials, they all like, um, was like, girl, you need to get some more content out there. But I was like, okay, I have to put more content out there. And trust me, when I thought about it, I'm like, he's right. But it's also, to me, I struggle with it as well. It's like, I feel like it's so much self-promotion of like, look at me, I'm traveling and I'm, you know, dressed in a beautiful outfit. And I, or I'm, I, I might, I'm gonna post something at my news, so. <laughs> Olympics, people with intellectual disabilities, and um, whether it's having had work with Hillary Clinton, and it's like,
trying to support her and get her elected, or you know, something that find what you care about and put yourself out there. And I don't know. So I have a, you want to use it in a positive way. What I'm saying, <laughs> and you have to find that balance. Like I'm trying and I struggle with is like what is too much? What it, what is that you want something? Somebody to know about you, right? That's a great answer. That's a great answer. So, so you you mentioned Hillary Clinton, and so I wanna I wanna use this um, a little bit to talk about this transition. So, age of twenty five, uh, you had spent basically your entire life uh, since your brother was dragging you around, um, focused on one activity. Uh, and excelling in that. And then you decided, okay, it's time for a new chapter. Uh, and I, I'm wondering if you could talk, you know, all of us really have long lives that have many different chapters in them. And there are these transitions. And I'm wondering if, if we could just talk a little bit about that transition. Because uh, sort of generally curious about it, what it was like, was it confusing, was it scary to say, oh, I'm putting aside what I've been doing my whole life. But one of the questions I have is, um, as you were making this transition, I, I think you kind of had to have a, make a decision about whether you wanted to have as much of a break as possible from what you've been doing in the early chapter, uh, or whether you wanted to try to keep as much continuity as possible, you know, go from being a skater to a teacher to, you know, to a commentator, yeah. all in that, that same world. And I'm just curious about how, what you were thinking about as you were making those choices, and what it, what it felt like as you were going through that. I really feel like I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is a therapy session. <laughs> Three of your closest friends just uh, enjoying it. Getting a glimpse of what happens in here. I don't know, sometimes. Uh, <laughs> I'm very candid, and I lately have been more and more open. And I have to be honest about the transition. I, you know, from the age of five, starting skating to you know, dreaming of going to the Olympics at seven, watching the Olympics and being like, oh, aha moment! I know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, and that was go to the Olympics. And for 20 years of my life, till 25, 26, I didn't have to ask myself. Wow, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? It's like very clear the schedule of the season for competitive skating. Um, and like all of you thinking, I'm sure if you're a freshman, junior, or senior, I'm sure seniors are going, what's next? What's next? It's the inevitable. And I wish athletes would be more open or you know talk about these transitions because it is that tough thing where you are identified as this professional athlete and Olympian and suddenly that identity is kind of stripped away um, and it was a lot of soul searching that I had to do and luckily I, I went back to school because that was something that I, I wanted to do and it was within three or three years at the University of Denver and grad school at Fletcher that it was like self-discovery, finding my passions um, outside of sports but it took a long time, and it, it wasn't pretty. And I think that's why it, it's such an opportunity, again, what you, the opportunity that you have in the next year or two years that you have left for three years is like this self-discovery self of asking questions, no questions dumb. And it's that thing, no, no question is dumb. Put yourself out there, try things, intern, experience things, um, and that's what I did, and transitioned into other areas, and at the same time making the most of your opportunity. And this is something that I shared to the round table earlier, is like sometimes having the courage to say something or connect with somebody. Um, figure skating opened a lot of opportunities for me. Um, and I, I knew at the time, at the end of my career, I'm like, I can make the most of these opportunities. I was at a state dinner with President Hu Jintao, President Bush, Secretary Kan Lejek Rice, I was at the head table. And I'll never forget, because I was at the end of the receiving line, which 
you get like a placard and you're like, so then someone can introduce you to the president and then take a picture. And I was at the end and President, uh, the president, uh, president Bush said, well, you're sitting at our table. We're gonna talk about foreign policy. And, and this was like 25, 26 year old. I was, he's kidding, right? But I went to the head table and he was right. So I sat there and I, uh, I had a you know, wonderful time. I spilled coffee everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and that happens to everyone. So I like, but I was nervous and shaky. And at the end, I don't know what prompted me to do this, but I, uh, I had a conversation where I have to introduce myself to Secretary Rice. And I said, You're a figure, you used to figure skate, so we have that common, in common. I was interested in going to the University of Denver, and I applied. And so we connected. And, at the end of a very, 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 very brief conversation, and I don't know what you all know about like elevator talk, if you did like professional development, it was my elevator talk, if you will, you know? I was like, if there's anything that you need me to do ever, you <laughs> 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 said, talking to the secretary, you know what I'm saying? I was like, please let me know. <laughs> and um, then it was, uh, uh, one thing led to another, and I ended up being appointed as the first public diplomacy envoy traveling on behalf of the United States and the Department of State um, with real people to people as an envoy. And I, uh, Ellen DeGeneres, do you know all? Yeah. <laughs> when she, she was appointed as an envoy and she joked in her you know, uh, speech, she said, I, I now have to go to the dictionary and see what envoy means. <laughs> and it's true, I was like, what, what is public diplomacy, what is, but I was studying IR, but at the same time, you know, I, I didn't know it as an athlete at the time, but I was representing in a way that's like engaging people to people, finding common ground, and, and here I was traveling as an envoy and having this really unique experience, and, and then led to an interest in foreign policy, and then led to many, many other things. So back to your question, it's like, I think sometimes you just have to, it's self-discovery, It's it never makes sense. And just that, as we were saying earlier, was that sometimes you turn around and it, you're like, oh, if you look back at like how you ended up here at NYU, and I'll, oh, well, somebody connected me here, or like introduced me, or told me about how great the school is, and then, and you're here, shut up, right? And so, uh, I guess from what I learned today and all the students, it's like being flexible, being a, a sponge. You know how cheesy that sounds, but it's true. It's like you never know where in 10 years where you'll be. You know, I think Ivan and I would be sitting at Fletcher at Murger Cafe. You know, if we looked at our time at Fletcher like 10 years ago, would you have anticipated being here? You know, that's, and so you just. Go with your opportunities, put yourself out there, learn from others, surround yourself with good people, which you already are with the incredible faculty and staff, um, and just have the courage to have that leap of faith. And it's scary sometimes. So that's actually, I mean, what you're, what you're saying uh, that really resonates with me is that in hindsight, it all makes perfect sense Everything is naturally leading you to this moment here at NYU Shanghai with Ivan sitting there. And Jun Shi, where's Jun, who started four months ago. There's Jun, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, they both uh, were associated State. with the Department of State. Uh, and so uh, everything naturally led to this moment. But if you were back then looking forward, you didn't see this stage here as the destiny you were working towards. Instead, you were trusting your gut and, 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 and going, going with that. And I think that is a great, a great message for everybody. In some sense, it means you don't have to over plan. Yeah. You don't have to say, OK, I need to figure out what the right path is to get to this stage. It'll happen. But that's not to say that current state of mind is trying to figure out what to do next. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'm honest with that, too. It's that you know, I, I never looking back 10 years ago where I was. And then right now, I'm letting things come to me and also seeking out things that are interesting as well. So it's, it's always,
always this like dance that we have to do that is incredible. It's, it, it wakes me up at night too, you know, trying to figure things out. Um, I remember at grad school, it was like, well, clearly I'm in this, on this path, and it'll direct me somewhere. And I am the type of person that wants to know what's next. I mean, I was trained that way, to know that whatever is unpredictable, I make it predictable, right? And kind of working backwards from my goal to how to achieve it. So it's, it's something that is new, not to be structured, I'm structured that way, and being uncomfortable in this place where the future is a little hazy, but being present and following your gut passion. And somewhere along the line, we'll look back and go, ah, that makes so much sense. So I, I have one last therapy question. Okay. Um, <laughs> you're great. Um, uh, so so it's, it's actually about what you've been doing with me for the last uh, 45 minutes. I, I think it's, it's human nature where when people are trying to make sense of the world we use categories. Nowadays, we use hashtags. And we apply them to things, and we even apply them to people. And so if we want to understand a person, you know, there's just a simple, a simple description. Um, and, and we don't have to worry about all of the complexity and the reality and the nuance of someone, who they really are. Yeah. And so, you know, you are hashtag world champion figure skater. And that's, that's, you know, when people meet you, that's, that's their understanding of you. And there's, because you're, you're a public figure and everybody who meets you has that, um, it, it puts a burden on you to try to make yourself real and allow them at least to add more hashtags along. Uh, you know, someone who's uncertain and trying to figure out the future and, uh, all of these complicated things that make you human. And I, I, I'm just wondering if you have any tips, because everybody actually has to do that. We, we want to give other people a way of understanding ourselves personally as complex people in the way that you have done amazingly effectively over the last half hour. Um, do, you, do you have some tips in your head that you are, are, are referring to as you, as, as you are yourself? Can I tell the audience that these were not the questions that I got earlier? <laughs> uh, it really makes me think. You know, I, I miss the academic kind of set, setting and where it makes you really think about everything. I think my first thought is that don't let people define you. And it's hard. I mean, it's sports. It was so easy to try and impress the judges. Like, what do they want to hear? What, in terms of music, what is it that they need to see on the ice? And it's that going back to the question was like, and how do you be, how do you become, how do you innovate when there's such structure and lines and you know framework and but being yourself and it's it's kind of having that work within the lines, but you can kind of blend outside the lines sometimes. Um, I think also, don't define yourself. Um, it's, it's something, again, I struggle with, because I'm often pigeonholed as an athlete. That's, as Billie Jean King, I hope most of you know who that is, out of line, pioneer of sports, women's equality, um, lots, every, I, spend the days talking about Billie Jean. Um, but she said to me once, she said, yeah, this, I remember going to grad school and I was like so scared. The Sierra was like in a climate that I'm not used to and unfamiliar with. But she's like, yeah, all athletes, everyone thinks athletes are dumb, right? She went right to it. She's like, athletes are dumb, right? And I'm like, I cannot. You get pigeonholed being an athlete. That's, but we are, we are a bunch of slashes. I was, Saying to the group, I'm like, yeah, I, I had a wonderful chapter of being an Olympic figure skater, but I knew that I could only do a triple lutz 
you know, to a certain point, and then you have to turn the page. As as hard as it was, that I did want to turn the page, I had to, um, and I didn't. I veered very close, uh, very far from something that was familiar. I could have easily done something that was safe, that was easy, but I didn't want to. You know, I didn't want to coach. I didn't want to do this. I want. I want to do something else. So that's what kind of made me swerve and go else, other places. So I think don't let people define you. Don't define yourself. Discover, enjoy, reinvent, uh, and lead the life that you want to live.